uh, I'd like to welcome you to uh, the first of our biostatistics seminar series for, uh, for this uh, semester. And uh, this is uh, got a flag of being a, a distinguished lecture series. So we're, we're uh, very, very honored to have uh, Professor Thomas Gerds from the Department of Biostatistics at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, here visiting us this week. He's actually visiting one of uh, our uh, faculty members, Hema Dishwaran. And while he's here, he's going to give us a couple of talks. One, this one that's uh, a little bit more uh, broad audience based, and then a more technical one on uh, Thursday that's uh, tease out more of the statistical aspects of what he's speaking on today. Um, I'll give you a, a little bit of background uh, about Thomas. Uh, so he's, he's German trained. He got his uh, uh, training in mathematics and statistics. Uh, both at the Free University in Berlin and at the Albert Ludwig University in uh, Freiburg. Uh, he was uh, a research assistant professor there for a while in, in Freiburg, um, and then since 2007, he's been an associate professor in the, uh, the Biostat department at the University of Copenhagen. That's a very, very strong department. They have some really top-notch people there, so um, he, he's, he's at a great place. His statistical interest, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about his statistical interest and a little bit about his uh, application interests because they're, they're quite fascinating actually. So he, he works on uh, the analysis of binary and longitudinal and time to event data. Uh, he builds uh, risk prediction models. Uh, he develops tools for bioinformatics, machine learning with applications to high dimensional data analysis. Um, a flavor of some of the things that he's been working on application wise, he's, uh, he's developed some algorithms for analyzing what's known as interval sensor data in dental research. Uh, he's developed an online risk calculator for traumatology and dentistry. Uh, he's done some work on tomography and colon cancer staging and follow-up. Um, he's looked at things like model uncertainty in life course analysis. Um, and he's even looking at uh, things like updating uh, predictions for ICU patients based on multi-state models. So it's a really fascinating blend of uh, skills that he brings the table and uh, today he's going to speak to us about a hot topic, personalized medicine, and specifically how what we in statistics call the cursed dimensionality uh, is in place. So welcome Tom. Let me, let me start with this anecdote from, uh, from the visit of Professor James Robbins to Copenhagen. So he was supposed to give two talks like I'm supposed to give two talks in this week. So in the morning all the mathematicians were gathered and he sat down and he said, um, I know I'm supposed to give the more technical talk in the morning and the less technical talk in the afternoon. It just happens to be the other way around. So you could imagine the people in the afternoon, they weren't following very much. So don't, don't worry, I, I'm not going to do that. There are no formula in my talk. And, um, and I'm, I'm actually presenting four of my, my projects. They are, you could call it like consultancy, but it's, like, it's more. I'm following these, most of them are PhD students. They have projects and they are related to personalized medicine. And that's why I've chosen to, to present here a work on uh, in, in vitro fertilization and also on two ca cancer projects that I have here where we in, in, in incorporate gene information. <clears throat> so this will, this will be the structure of the talks and, um, and I start here by the definition given by in a paper by Baker and Sar Sargent and they define personalized medicine as, uh, as we want to treat only those persons who are likely to benefit from the treatment. And a more complex definition, you find it on uh, Wikipedia, is here given a, as a medical model which uh, in, in incorporates a lot of information. And in particular, the aim is to introduce genetic, and they say here, or other information. I will get back to what they mean by and other information. And, and, and they also claim here on the Wikipedia page that there's practically no progress. And maybe if you look at, at the projects that I will describe during my talk, you will get an idea why, why there's no pro progress, or <clears throat> not enough pro progress. Now, five years back, personalized medicine was described as a vision, and that was done here by the president of the Mayo Clinic, Dennis Cortese, and he, he introduced here several things that have to be fulfilled in order to make um, personalized medicine something real for the patient. It has to be teamwork and information technology has to be involved and also the doctors need training in system engineering in order to be able to, to do um, 
to, to really implement this into clinical practice. <coughs> and, and here's a figure that he has in his, um, in his, in his um, paper. You can see it involves a lot of steps in order to make uh, personalized medicine something that we can, can use for the patient. And this is quite abstract, so I will try to give more concrete examples in order to, um, to discuss the details of what's going on. And I call this talk also a statistical perspective, so I will focus here on the statistical aspects. So looking back at what we have done to clinical trials, we statisticians have a good understanding of how to analyze randomized clinical trials. And uh, one main feature here is that we are trying to estimate population average effects. So it's, that, is, that is clear. Our models do assume that the treatment effect is the same independent of all the other factors. That's what we do in clinical trials. And, and as opposed to that, in order to do individualized medicine, we need a prediction which is for the, for the person. So we need to introduce a, a prediction model which takes, care, takes into account all the other factors that we can measure on a person. <clears throat> and we also need new biomarkers in order to make these prediction models more accurate as, as they are today. Now, um, to illustrate what, uh, what, I was, what, I, what I really mean here by the difference between the average and the individual effect, let me introduce you to the EPO study. So this is about heck and, uh, head and neck cancer uh, patients. They, um, they got radiotherapy treatment and they also get surgery if, they, if that is possible. And in addition, here we have a population of cancer patients that also suffer from anemia. And then in order to increase the blood hemoglobin level, these patients were treated by EPO. <coughs> and, and in the publication here where I'm, I'm working on the data of the Henker, Henker study, they identified, they claim they identified a new biomarker which could help to separate between patients that would benefit and not benefit from the EPO treatment. And so in this study we have 149 patients with non-missing values in the predictor variables. And you can see here, not for everyone, it was possible to do a complete uh, section. So this, the surgery was only complete for 35 of the placebo patients and 36 of the EPO tre treated patients. And it was incomplete for 14 in each group and no surgery was possible for 25 in each of the two groups. That may be important because there's some kind of result that, that may show that the EPO treatment stimulates the tumor if there's still tumor in the body. And that could have an adverse effect. So in order to, um, in order to analyze the trial, randomized clinical trial, we, we take here the outcome variable which is yes or no, the treatment was successful. And that was defined by when the blood hemoglobin level was increasing sufficiently and the, and the sufficient um, borders were defined independently for men and for women. And, um, and here are some predictor variables, age, gender, the baseline hemoglobin level, the treatment, whether or not I'm in the EPO group or in the placebo group, and then whether um, surgery was complete or not. And finally, the new biomarker, which was uh, positive in 68% of the population. And what comes out here is the typical table that you, that you get when you do logistic regression. You get odds ratios and you get confidence limits for the odds ratios. And what you see here is the odds ratio for the treatment effect is about 90. That's a, that's a huge effect and, and that, um, <coughs> and that, uh, that may, may, be, um, may be quite um, impressive. But does that mean everyone should be treated? I mean, this model is a logistic regression model which assumes that this treatment effect is independent of all the other variables. But even if this assumption was correct, I'm not sure if that, um, that means that everyone should be treated. And um, it is clear the factor of 91 is huge. So this is a model result which is only valid for the average population. But when we do, when we think about individualized medicine, we want to say something to the individual patient. And here we can compare the predictions obtained from this model that I was just presenting for a person, which here in this case is 50 years old and it's a man, and the uh, tumor was completely removed by surgery. And the baseline hemoglobin level was about 12.6 and then 
the prediction from the model tells us that in the treatment group, the probability that this person will have a sufficient increase of hemoglobin level is 97.4%, whereas in the placebo group, it's only roughly 30%. So that is a quite clear result. But now when we move to a person which has a different baseline level, all the other characteristics are the same, but the baseline level was 14.8, much higher, right? Then you see the difference between the treatment group and the placebo group is it's much, much smaller. And the person in the placebo group has a chance of that the hemoglobin level is increasing above the uh, sufficient um, limit here is or, uh, already 84%. So it's a, it's a personal decision whether the second person would take the treatment as compared to the first. Okay? But there's another, there's another reason why I have, uh, have this question here, does that mean everyone should be treated? And the reason is the survival part of the study. So in the survival part of the study, we, are, we have a different outcome variable, and that's the local regional progression-free survival time. And, um, and of course, since the blood hemoglobin level is increased by the EPO treatment, we would expect better survival chances. But this here is what comes out of the Henke trial, and you can see the, the EPO group has the improved survival curve. So, so this, is, this is a horror scenario for the people who were treated with the, with the EPO, with the, uh, with the EPO uh, in the EPO group, because they actually had um, lower survival chances. <clears throat> now, we, this is a univariate analysis. We just have one factor in here, just treatment, yes or no. Now we can uh, split this up and we, we do this here as they did in their publication. And in their publication they split it up after this new biomarker which they identified in their study. And when we look at the results here on the, on the left panel for the EPO biomarker positive patients, we see here the, the EPO group has the lower survival chances. But in the negative group it seems to be the other way around. And that is, that is an, uh, in statistical terms, that is an interaction, an effect modification. And if that was true, then we would be able to uh, recommend the treatment to the EPO receptor negative patients, and we would then recommend not to take the treatment to those patients that are positive, right? That would be an, a, a nice result. On the other hand, if you look here at the numbers at risks, they are quite low. And that is a problem, because the, these, these, these uh, graphs may be impressive, but they do not show the statistical uncertainty. So we cannot, this trial alone is not enough in order to put this into practice. And then if we look closely here into the tree resection status groups, we also see that in the, uh, the, the, the head <laughs> titles are missing, I apologize for that, but here the, these two panels are the this is the no resection group and this is the incomplete resection group. Whereas on the right hand side we see for the complete resection group the, the treatment seemed to uh, at least not uh, decrease the survival chances. And in the complete resection group then maybe the EPO treatment was not finding any tumor cells which, uh, which could be stimulated. So it's not so clear what ca came really out of this, um, of this analysis here. It is, but it is clear that um, it is not possible to do more studies because that wouldn't be ethical. And the only thing that is possible is to do meta-analysis, search the literature, combine results from different studies on the same type of patients. And here they concluded from a large meta-analysis that, that there's even a strong suggestion that, um, that the EPO treatment negatively influences the outcome. Okay. So that was my first example here. I will move uh, to a different example, and this different example is about uh, in vitro fertilization, so completely different subject. In this, uh, in this study here, the aim was to um, treat women with a certain hormone in order to, um, to have a, enough um, uh, follicles that could be then um, used to, um, to induce a pregnancy. And in order to, um, in order to do that, we, we um, we modeled the data, and uh, in order to understand what we did, uh, we need to say here this most important thing is that if we give too much of the hormone dose, then we can end up with the woman having this, uh, this thing here called OHS. This is a, the, this is a disease de related to too much of the, of the hormone, 
and, and that can even cause death. So that's, that's one part of the story. And the other is if we give a too low dosage, then we get too few major follicles, and that may then not result in pregnancy. So there's a trade-off, right? And the patient has to make a decision. So the standard doses, dosage is 150 units per day. Now, what, what, did we get, that, what did we see with 150 units per day? We have here the, the results from our, from our study. We have 276 patients, and um, <clears throat> we see a lot of them have appropriate response to the treatment. But then there are 33 that have had too few follicles, risking that there's no pregnancy in the end, and 88 had too many follicles. Right, so the aim here, individualized treatment, would be to reduce the dosage for the for the for the latter and increase the doses for the for the first group here. Okay, what did we do? We did logistic regression analysis, and then you know that maybe the aim was to have a result which fits into the pocket of a doctor in the clinic. So the aim was to have something that fits on a, on a piece of paper, which the doctor could pull out of the pocket and then look in, look up what the recommended dosage was. So the aim was here to find to look through all models models which which include at, at most two variables because then we could um, print the results on a piece of, um, piece of paper. And we looked here to all the all possible combinations of two variables and, uh, and compared the models by something we call cross-validation. And we use here the Breyer score, which is a measure of how well the model predicts the outcome. <clears throat> and you can see here the, the results. What came out, there were two models, both included two variables which were winning this competition, statistical competition. So these were the models that the statisticians were proposing here. And, uh, and you see here on the x-axis for both models, we have the enteral follicle count. The higher, the more likely we, we get a pregnancy. And on the y-axis for the risk of excessive response, we have the cycle length of the women. And on the for the risk of the low response, we have the age of the woman. And, and these two risks can then be commu uh, communicated to the doctor and to the patient in order to find the right, do right dosage. That, that was the result of our study here. And actually, that could be summarized in a diagram like that, where we have on the x-axis, we have the risk of low response to the treatment. And on the y-axis, we have the risk of excessive response to the treatment. And then here in the middle, that's the standard dose, 150. That's the color here, uh, roughly yellow, where you have the standard dose. And then in, uh, dependent on your predicted risk, we would then move away from the standard dose for the individual patient. So that would be individualized treatment. However, are we done? Is this a result we can use in, 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 prax in practice? Can we recommend that for patient counseling? Of course, based on the characteristics of the patient, follicle count, age, and cycle length, we can get predictions. But, how, but these predictions are based on, on data collected on the standard dose. So every person in our database was treated with 150, the standard dose, right? But, but if, um, if we want to change the doses, then we actually have no data in our database. So we have not seen what happens if we just give 100 units or 200. We have not done this uh, experiment. And that is uh, related to the title of my talk. This is some, in some sense the curse of dimensionality here. When you think about making a clinical trial for each doses, right? So you do for, you maybe take 10 different dosages and then you do a clinical trial for each of the dosages in order to see what happens. That would be too much. On the other hand, it's a good question, what is, what is evidence-based medicine in this situation where you move away from the standard dose and want to recommend something? We, do, we wouldn't like to extrapolate too, too much away from the, from the results of our study. But some, some general rules are needed in order to, um, to control what's going on. <clears throat> so I'd like to discuss the, the idea here of clinical trials a little bit more. So first, let me recall the main result that we have for, for using randomization in clinical trials. And the main result is actually a very interesting statistical result. And that is that if we remove 
independent predictive variables from our model, could be a logistic regression model or a Cox regression model, then we know that we are underestimating the treatment effect. That means that if we get a significant result, then we, have a, then we can be quite sure that the true effect is even larger. So that's a very important result and that allows us to do, say, a log rank test on our clinical data without looking at all the other characteristics of the patients. Okay? So that's, that's very important to have in back mind and in the, in the background. And, and the other answer is, of course, if we are after individualized medicine, then we should use the other information that we have collected on our patients. <clears throat> in order to be able to distinguish between those that likely respond to treatment and those that likely do not respond to treatment, we need to include the other information that we have collected. And, and maybe we are even after effect modifica modification, statistical interaction here. Maybe the effect of the treatment depends on some of the characteristics of the patients. <clears throat> now, what happened in 2010, Baker and Sargent, they proposed a new design for, for, for a clinical trial. And, um, and this, this was quite promising because they have uh, had a had a design where you only have to increase the sample size by 18.1%. And the trial has a 90% power. So very, very nice features here. And, and that was published in a, in a nice journal. However, the answer was uh, not much later from some experts in, in uh, medical statistics. And they, they revealed here that the basic assumption of the, of the paper was wrong. So they, they kind of claimed that one could use the control arm of the trial without uh, introducing a bias. And then th there was an incorrect assumption here. And, uh, and here the answer by Simon and Freitlin was that um, in, they did some simulations which showed that if we increase the number of features, that is the number, the amount of other information that we use in our model, think about SNPs, if you increase the number of SNPs that you introduce into your model, then you were inflating the type one error of your, of your study. And instead, they propose a, a different design, which is called the cross-validated adaptive signature design. And there you'd separate between the model development and the model validation. So what is important here, you cannot use the same data both to model and to validate. And that is, that is very important to, have a, a, to recognize. On the other hand, I'm not aware of any standards of, for clinical trials uh, that could then um, be, be, be used to prove individualized medicine works. So, so these standards are still, uh, still unclear. <clears throat> I would go for the cross-validation design. Now, if we want to introduce other information into our model, then we start here by the most simple model. We just have treatment and outcome. And the next step is then maybe we have, uh, we have cancer patients, so they are on different stages. So then the model becomes more complicated. If the treatment depends on what stage the patient is in, then, uh, then the model looks like this. And if we further want to introduce uh, age and gender, it gets more complicated. And um, you, you, can, you get the feeling, right? Uh, it, this, this model is getting more and more complicated. And, and here we have uh, smoking and s uh, social circumstances. There are all these things that may influence both the treatment effect and also the outcome. So if we now add other information, then this gets really a high dimensional space. And other information, I mean here blood tests, things that you can get from the blood. Also imaging, PET imaging, stuff like that, where you get a, a lot of signals from one person, maybe from the brain. Or you can introduce microarray expression data. I will show you one example with microarray expression data in a little bit, and another one where we introduce DNA, <coughs> SNP chip data. And um, maybe the model looks like this, right? And, and, and if this is the truth, then of course uh, the, this field is kind of progressing slowly, because then we need to, uh, we need to fill in all the missing information. Mm. So what's the workflow here? So we, 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 do, we, we are in the discovery phase here. I think many projects are still in the discovery phase. Of course, there are some validation data sets and things have been replicated. On the other hand, it is, uh, it is clear that first the next generation sequencing t technique will then find the, the causal, the causal bio biology results. <clears throat> 
Now let's talk about the discovery phase here, and I will show you some, mm, some results here for one of the projects that I'm involved. The project starts here with, a, with this paper, where the, where the researchers propose a, a gene signature which reduced the original dimension of the microarray expression data, which was 54,000, to only 128. So only 128 genes, that was the signature proposed in order to distinguish colon type, uh, colon stage um, two from, uh, to, no, no, not distinguish, I have to explain this more, more carefully here. So we have four stages, the Duke stages, four, one and four are quite clear, they have quite clear prognosis. On the other hand, it's more difficult to distinguish two and three. So the aim here was to use the microarray expression data in order to find stage two patients which are more like stage one or more like stage four patients and the same for the stage three. So we try to use the microarray expression data in order to see in which direction it goes. Okay. Now what did, what, what did we do? We tried to reproduce the results that these researchers had, had published. So we, we did the same statistical analysis. We looked here at the nearest, nearest trunk and centroid classifier. That's quite a black box to me. On the other hand, um, we could actually uh, get to the same results. So that, that, was, that was amazing. And then with this signature, we get a probability for each either two or three stage person whether or not it is more a stage four or more stage uh, one-like profile. So we see, look here at a independent Danish validation data set where we get on the last column here the predicted probabilities based on the microarray expression data that the persons, that the patients are stage four-like or stage one-like. And we see here that this statistical method uh, is, uh, is producing quite extreme probabilities. So it says for the first person, probability that this person is a stage four-like person is 100%. Of course, stage four has the worst prognosis, so we would expect this person to relapse. On the other hand, we couldn't see any relapse in the four, first uh, 48 months. So then whether or not in this case the model did good or bad is not so clear. Everything also depends on the follow-up. Of course, not every stage four-like person will relapse. So it's not so, it's not so clear. What, what I try to show here is the result table where we have for each person one line, right? So when we, are, when we look at the, when we open any journal in, medical, uh, in medicine, we look at the results. Results are usually expressed in terms of medians or averages, stuff like that. We look at differences in Kaplan-Meier, in Kaplan-Meier, but we rarely look at individual patient results. If we talk about individualized medicine, we, I think we, are, we have to say for each person, was, was the medicine working or not? Was the prognosis useful? What's the utility of the prognosis? And in order to do that, we need to introduce something which is, uh, you can call it the costs and the benefits of the treatment. And that, that has not been done enough in the, in the literature. Now, let me come to my final example here. And that is, um, that is about, uh, also about cancer patients, about leukemia patients. And they were treated with a bone marrow transplant. And um, the donors had the same, had matched uh, HLA types. And we had SNP chip data for all, each patient donor pair. And that is, a, that, is a, that is quite interesting because um, the idea here was to, um, oh, okay, the, the motivation is that due to this transplantation, two things may appear, uh, may occur. The first is we can have a graft versus tumor effect, and that, this is what we want, right? And then there's something else, the graft versus host effect, and this is unwanted. And so the aim here was to use the SNPs where the donor was different from the patient because what may happen if, if to introduce the transplant to the body, then the body's, body's immune system gets to see some, some genes that it did not see before. And in order to, to, to um, identify a signature or something like that, we, are, we were just looking at the SNPs where the patient was different from the donor. So that was a quite um, smart dimension reduction. On the other hand, we only had 93 patients. And the outcome looks like this. So what happens in, in this type of study? This is a multi-state model. Each person starts here at the transplant day. 
initial, and then the patient can have acute or chronic graft versus host disease diagnosed at some point in time, and then the patient can also relapse, and you can die from the relapse, and you can die from other causes. So this is a quite complex outcome, and we were analyzing here the relation between the genes and the cause-specific rates, right? So one result here was for the cause-specific rate for, the, for relapse, and we identified roughly 7,000 genes where the patient and the donor were different and where there was variation in our, in our population of 92 uh, patients. <clears throat> and then what, what came out of it, the most significant, statistically significant result appeared to be for a gene where only a single patient donor, donor pair had a positive genotype. So one out of 93 patients was, was r running the whole show here. Of course, we were then in our department discussing wh whether or not the p-value was wrong or maybe we should uh, try a different method for, for estimating the p-value. On the other hand, uh, we have to face it. We have a high dimension. We have only a small amount of patients. So th that's a big question. How many uh, gene positive, uh, genotype positive patients do we need in order to develop genetic treatment here? Right? So we, of course, we need larger sample sizes, but, but um, th this is, this is I, I think, illustrating the, the curse of dimensionality that we are facing here. <coughs> mm, now let me su sum up. First here for the inv individualized medicine, so it, uh, the traditional statistical procedures are well established for randomized clinical trials and cohort studies. And um, in order to change that to individualized medicine, we can use something else that we know in statistics, and that is prediction modeling. In order to, <clears throat> to apply prediction model, we need to do a lot of things, as I tried to explain while I was going through all these examples. However, it could well be that we can use prediction models in order to, to um, recommend individualized treatment. <clears throat> now, what is still missing is, are these the standards. What is the standard clinical trial that we have to do in order to establish a new gene signature or a new individualized treatment? That's a good question. And, um, and to sum up here the curse of dimensionality, it is clear we need, to, we need to look at these genes and we need to use the information which is in the genome and then uh, we will produce more and more data, huge amounts of data, and we have to face it, this is just, uh, this is just a very big dimensional space. Gene environment and treatment interactions, and uh, I approximate this here by life, right? And of course there's a third dimension and that is time. So if we introduce time here in another dimension, then everything gets even more complicated. And, and uh, there's something that I didn't mention, which is quite relevant for the individualized treatment here, and that has to do with my anecdote in the beginning. Professor James Robinson, he's, he, he, Robin, Robins, he's famous for developing optimized treatment regimes. And, and one problem that he is facing in his studies, and that is feedback, because when you change the doses, then because you have changed the dosage, the patient will react in a certain way. And since this word is a nice uh, last word, I will thank you for your attention.